Welcome, everybody. I'm guessing our guest doesn't need to be introduced tonight. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Donahue. I'm the Associate Dean for Public Affairs here at the Wilson School. And thank you for coming out um, on this snowy April afternoon to hear Robert Costa. Uh, Robert Costa has been called one of the next generation of journalists worth following. And he certainly is, as I can see from this audience. Um, you've seen his in-depth, insightful reporting for the Washington Post on the Trump White House and other things Washington. He moderates his own program, Washington Week, on PBS on Friday evenings, and is regularly seen on Meet the Press and Morning Joe. A highly dedicated journalist, Robert frequently travels across the country to talk to people in America about how policies and politics affect their everyday lives. Um, tonight, Robert will help us look back at Trump's rise as a way of understanding the current moment that we are currently in um, and to give us some insight on the upcoming midterm elections. So without any further, thank you. Hello, welcome. Thanks so much to Princeton University for having me here, the Woodrow Wilson School. I really appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. So much gratitude. Uh, for being at this wonderful university. I'm going to turn my phone onto airplane mode, so if any Trump cabinet member or White House staffer is fired, please let me know. <laughs> I will adjust and react accordingly. Uh, it's really, to, to understand where we are right now, and I, I'm sure everyone here has their own thoughts, I, I really go back to 2011. And whenever I start telling the story of how I got to cover President Trump. I go back to this moment in Pella, Iowa. And I was then covering the fringe of the American right. That was my beat. And I was covering this documentary filmmaker. I was supposed to meet him at a coffee shop who had just made a documentary about Sarah Palin. And his name was Steve Bannon. He told me to meet, me at a meet him at a coffee shop. And so I go to this coffee shop, and I see a barista who looks like my younger brother, Tim, very slim, uh, hipster type. And I see a guy who looks like an extra from Apocalypse Now. <laughs> and so I text Bannon. I say, Steve, where are you? And the, the extra stands up in his gorilla fatigues. He says, I'm Steve Bannon. I said, oh, gosh, here we go. <laughs> and so I sit down with Bannon, who I didn't, had never met before. And he had met, made this documentary about Palin called The Undefeated. And it was very much kind of a propaganda-style film, very pro-Palin. And he sits down with me, and he has a long beard, gray beard, and uh, he's wearing this fatigues jacket. And he starts talking to me about these themes I had not heard before. He starts talking to me about nationalism. And I say, nationalism, what is that? That seems like something Charles Lindbergh would talk about in the 1930s. That's not something mainstream conservatives or Republicans would talk about. And he says, you don't understand. Nationalism is the future. And I'm going to make Sarah Palin the next president of the United States. I said, whoa, she's not going to even run. Let's, let's be, she, she had just resigned from being governor of Alaska. Yes, she was, she was flirting with it in 2011, but she wasn't really serious about it. He said, the global economy has failed the middle class. The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have cost this country blood and treasure. And the middle class is going to revolt. And they're going to revolt by becoming a nationalist movement. And these are a word I had not heard. But this filmmaker, this unknown filmmaker from Los Angeles, a, a Navy veteran named Steve Bannon, was talking about this in 2011. And it stuck with me, especially his thing about making Sarah Palin the president of the United States, because he said she was against the bailouts, even though she was with McCain. She was against the bailouts. She had a son who was in the military. He thought she would understand the real pain of the middle class. I took notes. I put them on a shelf. Didn't think much about it. Steve Bannon was just another documentary filmmaker. But that, that meeting always stuck with me. And a few months later, I meet a guy named Sam Numberg, who most people don't know about. I, well, now you, you may. You've probably seen him all over TV. I call him the Pete Best of Donald Trump's presidential <laughs> campaign, because he gets fired right before Trump starts to take off. But Numberg, he introduces me to Trump in 2011. And he, Numberg, how did he get to know then Donald John Trump, the businessman? He got to know him because he went to wrestling matches for worldwide wrestling, where Donald Trump went. And he, his father was a, a big Trump fan, because Trump was part of the culture. He was a wealthy man, but he was someone who didn't look down in Sam's mind on kind of the working class New Yorker like Sam Numberg was and, and is in, in his mind. And Trump at the time was very controversial. He was doing birtherism. He was questioning uh, President Obama's credentials, his love of country. 
And it was something that was really ostracized in American political life. You weren't supposed to give it attention. And I was careful even then about Trump. But Numberg introduced me to Trump, and you immediately recognized with Trump, this is someone who's willing to go there. And you saw with Trump and Numberg and Bannon, they were not together at the time, but they were operating on the separate realm of the American right. And the, the, the Republican Party at the time was all about Mitt Romney. It was about the race of the Republican nomination. You had Michelle Bachman and others trying to be the Tea Party movement. But this whole time, there was this burbling movement on the American right that no one really knew what to make of, uh, but it was happening. And so I, I'm reporting on the American right, and I say to myself, I'm going to keep in touch with these people because one of my credos for, as a reporter is to assume nothing. It sits on my desk near two slogans, get the documents with my colleague Bob Woodward. He's been a mentor to me, told, tells me all the time, get the documents. But my own guiding principle has always been assume nothing. And that means whether you're right or left. I always assume nothing about Senator Bernie Sanders. He could maybe win the Democratic nomination in 2016. And I also assume nothing about Donald Trump. Maybe he could win the nomination. Because when you're a reporter, you learn that you cannot predict what is going to happen. There are so many twists and so many turns. And I hate to give predictions. I don't give them, because you just do not know where things go. And so I continue to talk to Trump. My colleagues at the time said this was a mistake. It was embarrassing to even talk to Trump. But what people don't recognize at the time, but now I'll admit, is I didn't talk to him just as someone to interview. This man was a source. This, there's no one who likes to talk more than Donald Trump. <laughs> if he went to an event, he'd be the first person I'd call, because this guy just wanted to talk and talk and talk. And so I would go up to the 26th floor of Trump Tower. There I am with Trump in around 2014, 2015, and he would just continue to talk. Now, I, as I said, I got to know him in 2011. I knew what a fake Trump ran, run looked like. In 2011, he was thinking about running against Romney, ended up endorsing Romney, didn't run. But in late 2014, early 2015, he really starts to make moves that, to me, as a political reporter, seems significant. He was talking to people like Corey Lewandowski, who was a, kind of an out-there operative, but really a seasoned operative in New Hampshire. He was talking to Chuck Laudner, who had won the Iowa caucuses. Most people don't know him, but he had won the Iowa caucuses for Rick Santorum in 2012. It was really a tie with Romney, as you may remember. But he was talking to serious operatives on the ground who were starting to see, could a Trump run work? He was doing some private polling. He was having meetings. And so I thought, Trump is really going to start to run. And he was. And, and what happened in 2015, he, he gave me the exclusive, which again, people thought we were crazy to cover him at the Washington Post. We put him on the front page of the Washington Post in February of 2015. And it was a, it's been a wild ride ever since. And what, what I really learned about Trump then is that he really had a shot at the nomination because of who he is. He would always talk in private about his father and crossing the river. He would talk about it, how his whole life was been about crossing the river. His father starts out in the boroughs. He wants to cross the river, whether that means in real estate or American political life. He would talk a lot about Roy Cohn, the infamous attorney who would work for, with Senator Joe McCarthy. And he said, these, my father and Joe McCarthy, these are the people that guide me, that guide my thinking, that I'm a pugilist. Anything is possible. There is no line of appropriateness. Anything to get power or to get a deal is fine. Everything is transactional. Nothing is ideological. And he would talk in these blunt terms. But he meant that he, he always tell me when we traveled together as a reporter, he'd say, don't you understand I love to fight? I love it. And he really meant it. He, he was in this to be part of American political life, not to really make a point, though he, of course, had some nationalist instincts on different issues. He really wanted to fight, have notoriety, be part of the mix. And he's a complicated person to cover because he's so controversial. But on a personal level, the one thing that always stood out to me when I would go up to visit him at Trump Tower was that he doesn't use a computer. At the time, he's in his mid to late 60s. He works on the phone all day. And we see this now in the White House. He's someone who does not use a computer, does not use email. He spends all day talking to advisors, sometimes the people who are around him. But he really wants to talk on the phone. He's, in, in a sense, like a reporter. Most reporters rather talk on the phone, because people are sometimes more comfortable talking on a phone being a little more long-winded, saying things that are intimate. And he talks all, on the phone all the time. But every day staring at him would be a picture of his father, Fred Trump. 
And it's a big wooden frame that sat in front of him with the mustache, black and white. And all day, he'd be on the phone, and this is what, every time you'd see him, and he'd be looking at his father, Fred Trump. And one time I asked him about his father. I said, what is this about your father all the time? He says, my father was a warrior. My father was a genius. He was the best. But it was a complicated relationship. Donald Trump was the only Trump child who sent away to New York Military Academy. And you think about his veneration for the military, go, turning to General John Kelly as chief of staff. So many of his closest friends and confidants tell me it comes back to his father, to New York, New York Military Academy. Because his father said, the people who are teaching you at New York Military Academy, President Trump, of course, did not serve in Vietnam. The people who helped him at New York Military Academy, those are the people that are true Americans, that are true American men. This idea of masculinity, American, what makes American presence an American hero. These are the things that are in Trump's head as he's running. He's an, he was an impossible candidate to cover in some ways. Uh, one, this one, in August of 2015, I'm flying with him from Las Vegas to New York, and I'm spending 12 hours with him throughout the day, but he will not sit for an interview. And we're finally about an hour away from LaGuardia, and Trump Force One, he calls it, his big 767. And he, he finally says, come up, we'll do the interview on the record. And so Fox News is blaring all these reports about illegal immigration, and he sits down, I put my recorder down, and we start doing an interview. About two minutes in, he starts screaming at the television while we're doing the interview. And he's calling illegal, this is in 2015, this is who he is, calling illegal immigrants animals. And he just keeps going on and on about this. And I try to bring him back to the ideas. I try to bring him back to the things I heard from Bannon. I try to ask him about nationalism. I try to ask him about populism. I ask about the silent majority, and it's the famous Richard Nixon phrase. He says he doesn't want to engage on anything historical, anything ideological. He says, I don't want to talk about populism. I'm common sense. There is no ideology here. I don't even want to, silent majority, whatever. This is what he said in 2015. And then he finally says to me, I won't say the word here, but he says a curse word, are you done? And uh, I said, I'm done, I guess. This is really not going well. <laughs> so I look at my phone with my recorder, about seven minutes. I've spent 12 hours for the Washington Post with this man, and I, we land at LaGuardia, and I call my editor. I said, I failed. I wonder if I, I just started the Post in 2014, early January 2014. I thought maybe I was going to lose my job. I mean, the Post spends a lot of money. You don't get a free trip. You pay for everything when you do these things as a reporter, as you have to. And uh, I had gotten seven minutes with the man. And it was mostly him screaming at Fox News and screaming at me. And so my editor said, that's really disappointing. And uh, they said, well, you did what you could. And I was disappointed. I went back to the Courtyard Marriott. I just started transcribing the seven minutes. Costa, Trump, Costa, Trump. I sent it to my editors. And 10 minutes later, they said back, this is golden. <laughs> and that began the trend of publishing all transcripts from Donald Trump. Becomes the most well-read story at the Washington Post that summer. And it ends with, are you done? That's how the interview ends. And so it was a wild, wild campaign. And you think about Bannon finally comes to the campaign in 2015. And you do see, at the end, this real grievance campaign against Secretary Clinton. Of course, the, the Clinton campaign is hurt by the Comey and the Russia, uh, uh, how the email investigation was handled by the FBI. But you really see Trump, with all of his rambling instincts, he finally gets Bannon and Kelly and Conway to come together after Paul Manafort struggles during the summer of 2016. And they do have this campaign uh, where, where they're able to win. The, the, the most telling moment, though, for me as a reporter during the campaign came in October of 2016. I'm with Trump again. We're, we're flying from Cleveland back to uh, New York. And uh, this, excuse me, we had fl flown in September of 2016 from Cleveland back to New York. And he and I had a tense moment on the plane. I didn't think I'd ever interview him again. Because I had interviewed him about birtherism. It all comes back to 2011. Who is this man? Who is this person who is now the Republican nominee who has owned the Republican Party? And I challenged him as a reporter and in a respectful way in September 2016 on his plane, do you still believe President Obama was not born in the United States? And he did not want to engage on the question. And I asked it repeatedly, and he became very irritated with me. He said, why are you asking this? You're, out, you're with me on the campaign uh, plane. Do not ask me about birtherism. I said, that is the question. Of, you're the nominee for the Republican Party. And he wouldn't answer it. He would not answer the question. So the next day at the Washington Post, front page banner headline, 
President Trump will not answer, if candidate Trump will not answer the question. He erupts, but he has to have a press conference the next day. That famous press conference where he surrounds himself with veterans for an hour on live television, and then finally, for 10 seconds, he says into the microphone, President Obama was born in the United States, and he walks away with as little enthusiasm as possible. And as a reporter, you, you deal with this sometimes. You say, hey, I asked the questions. That's my job. If it does, I don't talk to him again, I don't talk to him again. So that's September 2016. A month later, I'm sitting at the Washington Post on a Friday afternoon. My colleague who sits right next to me, David Farenthold, who ended up winning the Pulitzer Prize, great reporter, he gets the tape, Access Hollywood, publishes it on Friday afternoon. Big day for the Washington Post. We got the story, the story we think is going to change the election. And Trump's already sinking in the polls. This makes his poll numbers go immediately down. People in the Republican Party within an hour, the top donors in the Republican Party are saying to Trump, you must step down. Let Governor Pence be the Republican nominee. So the next day, I come into work. Because when you're in the campaign, you work every day. So I come into work Saturday morning. And knowing Trump since 2011, I say I know exactly where he is. He's watching television alone at the top of Trump Tower. I call his cell phone. What do you want? <laughs> I said, are you watching television? He is. He's alone watching television. And I say, can we be on the record? Because this is a big news moment. No one's spoken to him yet. First person to speak to him after Access Hollywood. He had recorded this video that was a little, looked like an episode of Wayne's World, but then he had retreated to the top <laughs> of Trump Tower. And he starts telling me about Fred Trump. He starts talking about life. And he starts, as he usually does, he takes you on. He says to me, on the record, he says, you do not understand life. I said, I probably don't. <laughs> Tell me. And he says, you don't understand life. I've been through everything, everything. I've seen it all. This is nothing. So I said, are you going to withdraw? Everyone wonders if you're going to withdraw. People within your campaign are thinking about quitting. They say, it's over, Mr. Trump. It's over. He said, it's not over. No one, you don't understand life. The media doesn't understand me. I'm going to be in this 100% the whole way. I will never withdraw. So that's our banner headline the next day. I will never withdraw. Trump stays in. Bannon stays in. Bannon's the only person in the room telling him that day at the top of Trump Tower to stay in the race. Of course, he wins the election. The only time I've ever seen President Trump with a flash of emotion, one of the coolest people I've ever covered in terms of just being ice cold on a lot of different fronts, only time I've ever seen it is on election night. That, that face you saw with President Trump, then President-elect Trump, that was an emotional person. They were not prepared, as you might imagine, in the Trump campaign to, be, to win the presidency. And Paul Ryan, President-elect Trump, they struggle. But Ryan and the congressional Republicans who I've covered for a decade, they see an opening. They don't like Trump. They had disowned him for the most part throughout the Access Hollywood episode. But they say to themselves, he doesn't actually have a plan. Bannon, to try to take control of the Trump transition, fires Governor Christie from running the transition. And that's when McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, and Ryan, they see an opening. Yes, he's an outsider. Yes, we don't really like him on a lot of different fronts. We're getting pressure to kind of back away from him. But he's malleable, perhaps, on policy. And you see the congressional Republicans say to Trump, focus on the cabinet. We're going to focus on the agenda. And that means we're not going to do infrastructure first. We're going to do health care. We're going to then do taxes. It's going to be our way. And you have the cabinet. They have a lot of trouble. They have uh, picking the cabinet, putting people together. They're, they're not prepared. Uh, and you have Bannon really take control of the administration from early on. Bannon and Stephen Miller, who's still in the White House, they write the American carnage speech that we all remember from the inauguration. And but this is an impossible situation for the Republican Party. Because when you're on Capitol Hill, when you're at the White House, and I was talking to then President Trump at the time, he did an interview with me in January where he starts talking about how he wants to have universal health care. And all these Republicans call me up 10 minutes after the interview is published saying, that, he didn't mean that. He didn't mean that. <laughs> I said, well, he said it. He said it. And he said, he didn't mean that. What he really meant was universal access to health care. I said, he meant universal coverage. Because he doesn't have an ideological guide when it comes to his agenda. But he goes along because he doesn't really know what else to do. And Ryan and McConnell are assuring him behind the scenes, we got this covered. And then in March, it all falls apart. And I get a call. I'm preparing for Washington week on a Friday afternoon. And it's President Trump. 
and he says, hello, Bob, just pulled the bill. And it was just, it was just like Access Hollywood all over again. Here was someone who was isolated but everywhere, ubiquitous but isolated. And he was saying, I don't understand this Republican Party. And he was on the record. I wrote the whole interview in 20 minutes. And he starts talking about this party is really six parties in one. And he's right. The Republican Party is, in a lot of ways, six parties in one. And they just weren't able to execute for him. He didn't really know how to close deals. He bragged about being able to cut deals on the campaign trail. But as he would acknowledge to associates and aides, how do you cut a deal with an ideological Republican? There's no earmarks anymore. There are no earmarks. So you can't really promise them pork. You can't promise them money. And in real estate, in New York, you read Art of the Deal, he loves to take the extreme position and have people come to him. But he's dealing with people who are transactional. Congressmen, let me tell you, and senators, they're somewhat transactional. But a lot of them are very much ideological. And if they have a position, this Freedom Caucus and others, they don't want to budge. And Trump found it very difficult to deal with that. And you see a lot of struggles as this administration unfolds. The Russia probe, Attorney General Sessions recuses himself, the rise of the women's movement. They do get regulations done. They get Neil Gorsuch confirmed onto the Supreme Court. They're able to do a lot of different sweeping things across the administration. By the summer, they're finally able to start getting things moving on health care in a more modest way. And Trump's had enough of a lot of the Republican establishment that has been guiding him. And so it's a turning point. He brings in General John Kelly to be chief of staff in the summer. Bannon has outlasted his welcome. And he is out there. And he's thrown out of the White House in some respects. He, he burned a lot of bridges internally. But he becomes this hard-charging figure on the outside, as he still remains today. And Kelly comes in. And he is that military figure that Trump has always turned to as president, as candidate, as a businessman, someone like General Mattis at the Defense Department, someone who's going to try to guide him. But it becomes, it still is rocky. They get taxes through at the end of the year. In some ways, the president is able to get uh, regulations through. He's able to get more judges through. But they lose a special election in Alabama in December. They just lose a special election in southwestern Pennsylvania. The White House, believe me, is well aware the threads are starting to fray on a lot of parts of this presidency. And, and you see the president now starting to shake up the cabinet. And I just wrote about this for Sunday's Washington Post front page with my colleague Phil Rucker about how you see the president now really going back to the, the Trump I knew in 2011, 2012, 2013. You have a president now who went through Priebus, has tired in many respects of General Kelly, even though he respects him and doesn't want to have the drama of getting rid of a, a decorated military general. But he wants to now be the Trump he always was, which is on the 26th floor of Trump Tower with one assistant answering his phone, no computer, making decision after decision on a rolling basis. Not because of meetings, not because the party wants it, but because of what he wants. Watching television with one eye, looking at his call list with another eye, constantly reading the newspapers and magazines in front of him, using the media as a way to understand where the zeitgeist is, where politics are moving. And so you see, General Kelly is still there, but the protocols he put in place have fallen away. The, the moderate advisors, if you, at least they're more moderate than President Trump, like Gary Cohn from Goldman Sachs, gone. Who's coming in? John Bolton, the former UN ambassador, starts this week as now the national security advisor, replacing H.R. McMaster. Larry Kudlow from CNBC, Starts today at the White House as the new White House economic advisor. Starting a trade war with China, Peter Navarro, who's as hardline as hardline as you can get on populist trade policies. He's now driving US policy. All these controversies at the same time. The Russia probe, it remains the biggest question mark in American politics. Where is Bob Mueller going? Is President Trump going to be really a target or just a subject of this investigation? Is the family going to get moved on or not? Is it just going to stay with Paul Manafort and Rick Gates and others who have gotten either, they're either cooperating like General Flynn or indicted? No one really knows. But amid all this looming investigation, the rise of the Democrats in red states and the Rust Belt and, and, and Mueller everywhere, every week seems every Friday we have to redo Washington Week at 6 o'clock at night because there's another indictment. <laughs> I mean, thanks, Bob Mueller. Uh, <laughs> It's just, it's a fascinating time. And it, to be at that White House every day as a reporter or going up on Capitol Hill, you see the, the things that President Trump 
so coveted all the time on the campaign that he, he, he cherished were having people like Hope Hicks, his longtime assistant, communications assistant around him, Keith Schiller, his bodyguard, they're gone too. So it's not just the moderates or the more even-tempered mainstream, whatever you want to call it, people around President Trump who are leaving. It's the people he personally likes, the people he turns to personally. And he, he's trying now to populate his inner circle with television people because he believes television is the way to communicate. Television is what got him to be president of the United States, not money, not a connection to a political party, but the media. And not the media just in terms of the coverage of the rallies, of course, that was part of it, but he really means being able to react. And to, to give you insight into how different Trump is, every other candidate, from Secretary Clinton to the 20, 100 Republicans that seemed to run in 2016, every one of them was the same in how they dealt with the American press, especially the national press, which is where if I wanted to interview one of them, I would have to go through a whole bureaucratic process. Not a negotiation, but the aides would be peppering you with questions. How long do you want? We'll give you five minutes, maybe four, three minutes. It's controlled, controlled, controlled. It's my generation, people in their 20s and 30s, who have made this. My generation is as tightly wound as they come, as you know. I mean, we're tight people in their 20s and 30s. And everyone wants to control every situation. And this was what I think hurt, looking back at my experience, people like Jeb Bush, the former Florida governor, who tried to operate in 2016 like a traditional candidate would operate. And they would try to manage the media. President Trump, for all of his chaotic management, he understood back when I first started to interact with him that the media was not something he could control, but something he wanted to be in. And he was omnipresent. He would, and he still does every day. He had 10 minutes yesterday on Easter Sunday between Mar-a-Lago and the golf course. And in those 10 minutes, he fires off four or five tweets, including one that said, I need to register as a lobbyist because I work for the Washington Post. <laughs> you know, people say to me, How, why don't you respond to him when he does this all the time? He does this fake news, fake news, fake news. And it's a fair question. But I always think back to what Bannon told me right after they win the White House in 2016. He says, Costa, I'm going to move the Brady briefing room from the former swimming pool Near, in the West Wing. I'm going to move it across Lafayette Square. I said, you're going to kick the press out of the White House? He said, I'm going to kick the press out of the White House. He said, you guys are the opposition party. And I said, I mean, I said just let me do my job, man. Said, we're not the opposition party. We're reporters. And, but he, he said, the Democrats, I don't wake up every day and worry about. And President Trump believes this as well. They, don't, they, they complain about the Democrats, but they, they say the Democrats aren't in power. The Democrats are pretty toothless with their investigations at times because they're out of power. They don't have the subpoena. They worry in this White House and in Congress about the press. And when they say fake news, they're trying to politicize news organizations. And I think you have to be very careful as a reporter to not get politicized. Because I don't want to engage with you or I don't want to engage with my sources as a political actor. I am here as a reporter to reveal power, to put a mirror up to power, and show it. But a lot of people, whether they're left or right, want to engage with us as a political group, which is dangerous, I think, for the whole democracy. And you see it even on the left. Senator Sanders have a great relationship with him as a reporter. But throughout the 2016 campaign, people forget. He railed against us constantly, the corporate media, to try to demean us, just like President Trump with his fake news. So I, as much as we want to be defensive, it's not our job, I think, to be out there to be defensive. But we're at this really, we're going to get to discussion in a couple minutes. But I just want to say a couple things. I know a lot of people have questions. Uh, we're, at, we're at this moment where we really don't know where this president wants to go. But on foreign policy, the meeting with Kim Jong-un, you see him turning to Bolton, turning to his own instincts. Uh, it is really, when you talk to people, we talked to 23 sources for this Sunday story, Rucker and I did. And you really have a sense that this is a turning point in the presidency. The president is, in effect, functioning as his own lawyer. John Dowd is gone as his attorney in the Russia probe. He's functioning as his own chief of staff. He's turning to himself, not to any particular advisor, again and again. Who did he have dinner with on Monday night? The same people he had talked to back in 2011 and 2012. Corey Lewandowski, Dave Bossie, his original political soldiers. Who did he have dinner with on Thursday night in Mar-a-Lago? Don King. <laughs> we called up Don King, and we said, what do you make of President Trump right now? He said, SKD. I said, what does that mean? He says, in the ghetto, 
We put this as the kicker of our story. He said, in the ghetto, that means something kind of different. <laughs> I said, we'll use that, Rucker. That's, whatever that means, we'll use it. I don't know what it means. But Don King. Don King's been convicted of manslaughter. <laughs> and our president chooses to have dinner with him. And Don King's talking with him about Stormy Daniels. And th this is where we are. <laughs> but the only thing I'll say is, I don't like to predict at all, having been up close with Donald Trump for a long time, there is no one who is more relentless that I have ever covered than Donald Trump. That man never stops. Never. 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, Nonstop calls, nonstop movement. If you, ever, if you haven't been to a Trump rally, the only thing I've ever seen close to his power of personality is president, former President Bill Clinton. The only person who walks into a room. I asked, well, one time I asked Ben Canada Trump, what do you do when you walk into these rooms? And he really reads the crowd. I said, well, how do you read people? And he says, I read people as strong or weak, friend or foe. That's it. That's how he sees people all the time. Ryan, McConnell, Schumer, friend or foe, strong or weak. And because he thinks in these simple terms, he's very hard to kind of negotiate with. He's hard to read. But there's more there than a lot of people realize. When you, when you really talk to him, he's thinking about his father. He's thinking about the 1950s and 60s in New York. He's thinking about crossing the river. He wants to fight. This is someone who willfully went to worldwide wrestling. This is someone who chose to run for president on the birther issue for a long time. He's, and right now, he, as Rudy Giuliani told us over the weekend, former New York mayor, he, see, he said, for a year, Giuliani told us, Trump was not really sure what to make of the presidency. He was shocked that he won. He always had confidence that he could win, but he really didn't think he was going to win. He's shocked that he won. And now a year in, we're in April of 2018, as Giuliani put it, he has an open field. Some people are alarmed by that. His friends think that's good. But that's where we are. A president who's actually settled into office as an outsider. His agenda has stalled on some uh, issues. He's gotten a few things through, but he's not going to get DACA through. There's no appetite to move on immigration at this point before the midterm elections. They barely got a spending bill through. And of course, the president was fuming about that. But it comes down to what I said about assume nothing. I don't assume anything about what he, what's going to happen in 2020. In fact, I don't assume who could be the Democratic nominee. Because just like I didn't try to assume with President Trump back in 2011, 2012, you can't assume anything as a reporter or, I would argue, as a, as a citizen. And I, a, few, a couple months ago, after the Golden Globes, I got mocked again for a front page story. I wrote a front page story on Oprah Winfrey. People said, how could you write that? I said, why not? Why not Oprah? Not that she will be the Democratic nominee in 2020, but when you're out in this country as a reporter, and this is all anecdotal, I'm not a political scientist, I'm not an expert, I'm just a reporter, but when you're out there in this country and you sense the grievance people have on, on both sides post-2008 about this global economy, about the wars that have happened, and you really plow into them as a reporter, then you start to see there is an unrest that is so unpredictable in this country right now that it's not really actually about Trump. I told the editors of the Washington Post two weeks before the election, I went across Wisconsin, wrote a story about it, across Pennsylvania, drove from the corner, southwest corner of Pennsylvania, all the way over to Bucks County, where I grew up. And I encountered the same phenomenon the whole time. I would ask someone, well, middle class, white voter, and I'd say, who are you voting for? I hate them both. Hate Clinton, hate Trump. Four or five questions in. Who are you voting for? Uh, I don't like them both. Six questions. I said, who are you voting for? Trump. 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 I said to the, my editors, this is crazy. People must be lying to the pollsters. Because there was such a social shame, whether it was for Sanders or then for then candidate Trump, to even talk about how you're feeling. And I said to these people, why, didn't you, why do you lie to me at the front? And they said, I can't even talk to my own spouse. I can't talk to my family, my kids. I can't talk to, at work about what I really believe. But they're so desperate for change that they're willing to consider things like Donald Trump. They're willing to consider things like Oprah Winfrey. And it just underscored to me, assume nothing.
Thank you. As always, I'd like the students to come first, and then if we've got some time, but we do have a hard stop at 5:45. So come on, students, don't be shy. Come on, going, going. Okay, now I'm opening it up to questions. We have half an hour. No questions. Oh, there's two mics here. So please come to the. Oh, thanks to everybody in the overflow room. I know there's people over there. Thank you, wherever you are. Fast forward to 2020. Oh gosh. You're, you're the Democratic nominee. How do you run the campaign to win? It's a great question. How do you run the campaign in 2020? When, it, when I was just talking to you about how every candidate wants to control the process, I'm already getting a sense now of who's going to be the strong candidate in 2020 if they choose to run. Because you cannot be a controlled candidate in this environment. Because one, you have to remember, President Trump starts from the position he wants to destroy you. He likes to destroy people. So if you come at him, he welcomes it. And if, he, if you come at him, be prepared. He's going to try to destroy you, personally and politically. Ask Senator Rubio, ask Governor Bush, what was it like on those, those debate stages when he came at you? They don't like it. And a lot of people aren't really eager to run right now in the Republican race for, to, to run a primary campaign against President Trump. But the Democrats, I, I'm keeping an eye on people who are, yes, there's Vice President Biden, who's likely going to be the front runner. But he's the front runner in the same sense that Jeb Bush was the front runner at this point ahead of 2016. Who knows who's going to actually emerge? But if you're going to emerge against President Trump, you need to know how to fight at his level. That doesn't lose class. You want to keep your class, you would hope, as a political figure. But who else is out there that could connect with the Trump voter? Who could flip the states back that Secretary Clinton was not able to win? Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. And so I'm, of course, networked in with the Biden sources, trying to keep an eye on him because he has the Obama coalition, perhaps in some respects, behind him. But what about Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio, Senator Klobuchar of Minnesota, people who come from the, the middle of the country, people who understand the Bernie Sanders voter who wants to see a more progressive Democratic Party but may not turn off the Trump voter, someone who can maybe run against Trump about his businesses, the way he's using the Trump hotels, all these issues out there running against Trump as someone who may have broken his promises, and to try to connect with them, those working class voters, in a powerful way, not just as a Trump, Trump referendum or as an anti-Trump. But they also have to have some savvy with the media. You cannot be a candidate these days, I would argue, as a reporter, and think that you can just have everything your way, seven minute interviews, stage speech. How are you going to be out there, present on Twitter, on cable? Are you going to call into the shows? Are you going to call the Washington Post on the phone? Are you going to be able to build a national profile that can truly compete with President Trump? And tr President Trump, because he's not guided by ideology, Bannon had it more than President Trump. President Trump's ideology is winning. And so Biden, of course, I think right now, if you're a betting person, would be best positioned for the nomination. But you have to look at other names that are out there, people who are an, an Oprah Winfrey, a Mark Cuban who runs the Dallas Mavericks. Yes, sir. Sorry, I didn't mean, mean to interrupt. Um, I'm a master's student here, second year. Thank you for your talk. Um, do you think there's any validity to the claim um, that's been made, the criticism that um, outlets like the Washington Post um, contributed in some way to Trump's rise, um, not only in terms of giving him coverage early on, but also in creating sort of a, a moral equivalence um, in terms of all the coverage of the Hillary emails and, and those kinds of issues. I appreciate the question. He asks, is, is the Post, is other media organizations, are they responsible for the rise of Trump? My argument, my observation is, I don't think the media did enough to cover Trump. That, in fact, right now, we should be doing more scrutiny of all the candidates that are looking to run in 2020, including the Mark Cubans and the Oprah Winfrey's. Because so many people turned a blind eye to Trump, they laughed at Trump. He was able to escape scrutiny. Did he get too much coverage on the rallies? Should rallies get blanket coverage just because it's someone with a huge personality who can create news? There's a, I think there's a real debate to be had about that. Is it healthy to have that kind of coverage of a political rally? Probably not. But there was not, believe me, every time I wrote about Trump in 2015, we, we were told not to really look at him. People said, don't cover him. We should have been covering more of what Trump was doing. What's really his relationship with Roy Cohn? When I, I was a 
taken aback when I was with him on the plane. He's calling in front of a reporter illegal immigrants wild animals. Who is this person? What more do we need to know about him? And, and because there's, we, I felt like I wrote it for every story, the norms have been shattered. Yes, the norms have been shattered in American politics. The way things are supposed to be or were for decades aren't how they are anymore. But we need to adjust to the media and not just assume someone's on the fringe is now always going to be on the fringe. I covered the fringe for a living for years, from 2010 to 2014. That was my whole job. And now everybody I covered on the fringe is at the center of American political life. <laughs> well, it's not my fault, but thank you. Thank you. Anyway. So let's turn down to the next midterm elections. So I know you say you don't predict, but I'm still going to force you to. All right. So uh, let's say, so everyone has this idea of this huge uh, uh, ensuing blue wave. How do you think the relationship between congressional Republicans and the White House will change, either if they barely keep onto the House or if they lose the House? If they barely keep onto the House, it's going to be a very difficult, it'll be a broken government. I mean, they can barely get something done now with having a pretty solid majority with House Republicans and Senate uh, Republicans. If the Democrats take over, I mean, I've spoken privately to, to House Democrats, there's a move to impeach. If there's a real movement on the Mueller probe in any respect, but even now, there's talk of impeachment should the Democrats take over the House. But the Democrats are more unsettled. They, it's a shame that Democrats aren't getting more coverage, because it's actually the, one of the most fascinating stories in America right now is the Democratic Party. But because of President Trump and the constant stream of news, no one's really paying attention to the Democrats. But you look at the Democrats, and, and Connor Lamb in southwestern Pennsylvania, Connor Lamb says, he just got certified yesterday, he, he, he said, I'm not going to support Leader Pelosi for Speaker in the Speaker's race. You see a lot of Democrats now from these red states saying, oh, I'm not sure about Pelosi. Is she a powerful fundraiser? Sure. But she's politically toxic. She was able to win the House with the Democrats in 2006. Maybe she's not the, the head of the Democratic Party come this fall. And the question the Democrats are going to have to have, and Pelosi's getting a lot of, having a lot of internal discussions about it right now, is if they do win the House back, do they really want to be the party of impeachment? Is that the way to go? Is the base already going to be fired up enough for 20? Do they have to follow through with impeachment? Will it be seen as overstepping? And they also know that there were moments in the last year when they didn't think President Trump was way out there. They were actually able to cut a budget deal with him. A lot of Democrats voted for this most recent spending bill. They think on gun control, he's already signaled, and Republicans like Rick Scott in Florida have so shown some movement. He, Scott has an A-plus in the NRA. President Trump says he'll never betray the NRA. Yet they're starting to show some movement on gun control. So you got a lot of Democratic discussions happening do we really just want to do impeachment and just close the hammer on him? Or is this guy going to burn Republicans? Could we coax him away from the Republicans and divide a government and say, work with us? Let's actually put some parts of Obamacare back. Let's do some gun reform. It's a risky gamble. A lot of Democrats say, you can't trust Trump. They'll only do what's best for Trump. And you see him already blaming the Democrats for the last two days about DACA. But again, with Trump, they also know a lot of bluster, but he does cut deals. And he has walked away from the Republicans repeatedly. So I think the Democrats, it's, it's just a great story. I've, I've been trying to get out there. And the Democrats have been savvy. Look at Bob Casey in Pennsylvania running for re-election this year. He has been further populist than Trump on trade. Democrats are trying to steal back trade. You, you saw Senator Brown, Senator Casey, they didn't criticize the president's tariffs. They encouraged him. And so you see the Democrats saying, we, we can't let Trump own our issues. We, can't also, we want to have that resistance with us, the impeachment group, the Women's March. We need to have them, but we can't be just that, because they say, let's steal a little from him if we can in 2019, if we win back the House, maybe work with him, then impeach him, kind of get some something for them, then move on him. <laughs> so it's, just, it's a political calculation. Thanks for being here. Could you comment on Pence? what his position is in the White House, his relationship with Trump, just a stream of consciousness on Pence, if you could. Well, it's funny. Vice, the question is about Vice President Pence. We, I, wrote, I felt like the article we wrote on Sundays for Sunday's Front was about 2,000 words, and I got an email from a reader. He said, Vice President Pence is not mentioned once. <laughs> so that's true. He's not. I mean, based on my reporting, Vice President Pence is there constantly encouraging President Trump encouraging President Trump privately, encouraging President Trump publicly, raising money for traditional Republican candidates across the country, not a heavy hand on policy. He's someone who, who says the, the same phrase in every speech, our broad-shouldered president. <laughs> I mean, I, I assume the president has broad shoulders. It's just a strange line in some ways. Right? 
But the, he, he's always helpful. And I asked some people close to Pence, why is this? I said, you know Trump. <laughs> you don't want to get one inch away from him because he pays attention to everything, everything. I remember when I was on the plane with him as a reporter, he'd watch who was eating what food. Rich man, but watches what people say, constantly on TV, watches what people eat, watches how his money is spent, watches how his reputation is being handled. And so Pence made the decision, never is really connected with the president on a deep personal level. You don't see him golfing together. But he says, loyalty is the currency with this president. I will be loyal. And people close to Pence, I won't say who, say, we also understand the obvious, that this presidency is torrential, and it's, it's chaos, and it's news. Who knows what's going to happen? Michael Pence could be president of the United States. So stay cool, they say. Stay steady. Keep your head down so it doesn't get chopped off. Sure. Thank you so much for speaking. Uh, I remember in 2004, after George Bush won, my parents being Democrats were devastated, but the general consensus was that people were going to root for the president no matter who it was. I don't think it's the same way anymore, and I'm curious about whether or not you're rooting for President Trump, especially in this new Trump-centric <laughs> Trump uh, administration. What do you mean? I mean, we don't, it's not our job to root or to jeer. I mean, I work for PBS, Washington Post, NBC. I mean, you don't root for a candidate. You got to cover it. The one thing I do is I don't root for anybody, but I do try to stay emotionally uninvolved. I mean, because you cannot become wrapped into what all this is all the time. It's for you all to decide as voters what you make of it. I can't start saying every day, what is this like for me? How is this? This is crazy. How am I doing this? I mean, people, we get, sometimes people say, oh, you're always so emotionally uninvolved. Yeah. I mean, if you're a mechanic, you don't sit around talking politics all day. You, you fix the car. I'm a reporter. I report the facts and then I leave, put my views on the shelf. No one cares. I learned a while ago, I mean, I'm 32, but when I started reporting at 22, I realized people did not care what I think. <laughs> they care what I know. And so I can tell you what I know, what I've seen, smelled, observed, but it doesn't matter what I think. Um, Bob, as a student of history, mm -hmm. do you see any parallel between the demonstrations of different groups in 1968 to the groups that are demonstrating in 2017-18? The Women's March, the students, and this week, teachers, people in education. In Oklahoma, sure. Powerful. I, thank you for the question about the movements. I think I went to the Women's March as a reporter, went to the recent gun march as a reporter. It's Fascinating to see these marches actually happen in real time because so much of what's happening in this protest movement with President Trump is online. And that you, what's intriguing is that the Women's March began in early 2017 and it was this flash mob across the world and then it just fell apart. And the Democratic consultants I know say this is really depressing for us. No one's marching in the streets like they were doing in the 60s when, during the Vietnam War. And a lot of Democrats feel like we're in a 1968-type moment. This is like the Vietnam War. It is apocalypse now. This president's so much of an outsider, they think they worry for the future of the country. Where are the marches in the streets? Because they, ha they haven't happened. The, the recent gun march was really powerful to observe as a reporter. There were people there by the hundreds of thousands really trying to march on an issue. But it wasn't an ideological anti-Trump march. It was for an issue. It was about students. It was about families. The, the thing that really struck me at that gun march was seeing so many young parents with strollers. They, they said, I'm, I had enough with it. And retirees as well, saying, no, our grandchildren, our children are just not going to be part of these guns in schools anymore. But the Democrats are worried that so much of protest movement now is on the phone, and that the whole generation is just locked in. There's no marches on college campuses. Where, where are the marches at Princeton? Like they were, they're probably not happening. I know they're not happening at most state universities, because you, you go visit a state university, everyone's just, they're joining a Facebook group or tweeting, which is fine. That's a form of protest. But it's not scaring politicians. So you start to see the gun movement that's political, but it's not as political. But a lot of politicians now are accepting that they're just not going to see the marches in the streets. That because we're not at war, and because of some of these fundamental issues I was talking about, where so many young people don't like Trump, are socially progressive, but they also feel like they have no economic opportunity, 
They're confused about really where they want to be politically. And so they signal, as they say this generation, virtue signal, they're anti-Trump, but they're really not deeply political in the same way people from the baby boom generation were during the 1960s. Thank you for coming. Right now, the U.S. seems to be focused very, very heavily on domestic issues. And with the recent re-election of Vladimir Putin and his large support domestically, I mean, 85 percent almost, uh, although rigged election, uh, and Xi Jinping being uh, basically given free reign to rule China for as long as he wants, do you think this is going to affect the domestic election coming up in 2020? And as well as, does impeachment make this nation look weak while our quote-unquote enemies and adversaries are uh, continuing to solidify power and gain strength abroad? Uh, on the first part of your question, the rise of Xi Jinping is the biggest story in the world. And you read his speech, the 2049 speech, I mean, this is someone who says, talk about nationalism. Nationalism is on the rise across the world, across Western Europe, and it's dominating China. I mean, Xi Jinping is saying, I am going to be the future of China. He even tries to look like Mao Zedong in his appearance. And, he, and in that speech was, China will dominate the 21st century. And there's not going to be a competition. We're going to dominate, he said in that 2049 speech. And you see President Trump trying to come at him with trade. But the Chinese are, are clever. They're coming right back at Trump and saying, we'll work with you on trade. And in fact, we're going to help you with North Korea, too. So China's savvy. They had Kim Jong-un, for the first time ever, takes an out of uh, North Korea trip on an armored train into Beijing. So now the Chinese, which the US likes, is trying to help be a broker with the meeting. But China's also saying, we're going to make the decisions when it comes to North Korea. We're going to, you, it's fine you had the initiative with the South Koreans, President Trump, but we're actually going to be the ones who make this happen. And you see, it's interesting today, it was announced Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of Japan says, me too. I'm going to come to Mar-a-Lago in two weeks because I want to meet with President Trump. And, and even in Japan, rise of nationalism in Japan. Uh, people say Abe is Japan's Trump. And, and, and you see in, in uh, Europe, in the Middle East, R Turkey, with Erdogan, this Trump is not a singular figure. Uh, again, I'm not a historian. It's for other people at Princeton to study. But <laughs> nationalism everywhere is having a potent effect. Uh, I, on the impeachment question, whether it has a consequence on foreign policy or not, I mean, the world is so hyper aware of what's going on day to day with President Trump. Whether impeachment suddenly knocks him off, perhaps. I mean, in 1998, Bill Clinton was certainly rattled by it, but he did fine in the midterm elections and he ended his presidency pretty strong. Uh, but I don't think that's going to be a calculation most people make in the Democratic Party should they win the House. I was struck by what you said about uh, how the media might have covered Trump more deeply. And I'm wondering, with this new phenomenon, are your fellow journalists and people you know in the media talking about how to change their game up to, to cope with the new reality here? Well, you see at the Washington Post and elsewhere, there's a big focus on the big story. Everyone's trying to do accountability journalism, fact-checking, in-depth reporting on the White House, in-depth reporting on regulations, on the administration. Uh, regardless of your political views, this is a hot story. And there's so many unknowns. We don't know these people in the cabinet, most of them. Scott Pruitt, where does he come from? He's Oklahoma. He's attorney general. He, he, no one knows him in DC. And we just keep reporting and reporting and all these different figures across the line. So it's got everybody engaged. And the one thing I've noticed is our readers are engaged. Our viewers are engaged. This country is sitting up, and they're paying attention. I've, I've only been a reporter for 10 years. But I, I've never seen it like this, where people are truly paying attention to reporting. And we're aware of that, and we're trying to meet the demand with accountability journalism and, and narrative journalism that tells the story of this American moment. Uh, some things go by the wayside. I wish we were doing more on Democrats, as I said. But we're trying to really cover the Trump administration and cover the world. So you're talking really about national journalists. Yes. And Sinclair. Yeah, and getting a script on what to say. Can you touch a little bit on sort of the national reporting versus local reporting and on concern about mm -hmm. sort of control of local reporting? So uh, she's referencing, the, the dean's referencing the Sinclair story real quick. Sinclair is a private company that has, over the last four or five years, really started to buy up local television stations across the country, and it's conservative in its corporate management. And Boris Epstein, a former Trump campaign advisor, has a segment on Sinclair that's fed to a lot of stations around the country. 
and it's under intense scrutiny today because people are more aware now because of some new reports that Sinclair is asking its local broadcasters across the country to make these statements on air, must read statements for these local news reporters that say fake news, other people are fake news, we're not fake news, uh, really trying to divide the media and, and paint the media as biased. And this, of course, has people at mainstream news organizations concerned that this is kind of a media company is trying to start these kind of battles with fellow journalists in a time when we're trying to just really report the news. Uh, and I, I, if you look at the rise of Sinclair, it's one part of the, the local media story. But I, I will say the biggest tragedy to me is in national reporting right now is the collapse of reporting on state houses. I mean, you go around the country, as I do, and you go to the state house after state house, empty press corps in many respects because the money's not there to fund the reporting. Craigslist, the internet, these local and regional papers that were powerhouses in the 80s and 90s and 2000s even have seen their advertising dry up. There's no one who needs to buy the big spreads in the paper anymore. And so now they're, they're buying Washington Post stories to put on their front page or Associated Press stories to put on their front page. And then they have one person at the state house who's covering it for 30 papers regionally. Difficult situation. And it, it has made this culture that I've picked up in my reporting, where so much is nationalized, that you go meet voters, they're not really reading the local news, they're not talking about their governor and their senator and their congressman, they may not even know who their local congressman is. They're following President Trump, they're following Leader Pelosi, they're following the national issues, they're watching Fox or CNN or MSNBC. They're not reading the local news, and that has changed this country in ways we can't even really process yet. When people aren't connected to their community in any real way, they're also not connected polit politically. It comes down to that Robert Putnam book, we all know, Bowling Alone. This is the isolation in this country has also nationalized this country. And the depletion of local media has enabled corporations like Sinclair to come in and buy these stations at low market value and own much of the United States in terms of local broadcast. And it's changed the face of the American media. And that, so many people don't even realize when they watch their local news now, they're watching a conservative organization uh, pr provide them news because it has an affiliate that seems like it's a mainstream affiliate, but it's owned by Sinclair. And as I say to all of you, do your due diligence about what you're consuming as news information, whether it's on Facebook or your local broadcast. Well, as we see with what's going on with Israel and Palestine right now, not going too well. Uh, tragic situation with all the deaths. Uh, Kushner is someone I got to know during the campaign. He is dedicated to the issue of Middle East peace. It's something he talked about during the campaign. But there were people who were advising President-elect Trump, don't bring in your family. And President Trump would reply to them, that's all I know. The Trump organization is a family organization. In a world where I'm constantly out there, he would say, the only people I can trust are my family. And they said, if you bring your family in, it complicates everything because people are always going to see them as family, not as aides. So Kushner and his wife, Ivanka Trump, come in. Don Jr. and Eric do not. They're running the businesses. And Kushner has assembled this large portfolio, the Office of American Innovation, which is supposed to change government. We'll see how that goes. And he's trying to do Middle East peace. And he's built a lot of relationships, like with uh, uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Salman. And uh, he, he has relationships in Israel. But he struggled because of the Russia investigation and the scrutiny on his businesses from different, front, uh, different probes, whether it's the state of New York or the federal probe, having to go talk to Mueller. He's had a tough time with such power, with such a profile, to really make a lot of progress. And he's a low-key guy. I mean, if you knew Jared Kushner, if you interacted with him, you'd be surprised. He's someone who's very close to President Trump, but he's not, he's the opposite of President Trump. President Trump, if he was here, he'd overwhelm all of us. He'd be everywhere, yelling, talking. Kushner is a quiet guy, and he wants to focus on policy. But it's been complicated for President Trump because he likes Kushner, he trusts Kushner, he wants his daughter around, he trusts his daughter. But they've gone through a lot of trouble over the past year, just in terms of political attention, attention from the investigations. 
And so you see at times in our reporting, President Trump's asking General Kelly, can you help me deal with Jared and Ivanka? Can you help me handle this situation? Because there's no easy answer. They don't want to leave the White House. They're now close to the center of American power. Most people don't want to leave that. People always say, oh, they're going to go back to New York. You don't see them running back to New York. To do what? I mean, they could find jobs and do fine, but they're now in the White House. And if anyone who's covered it or been there, it's an intoxicating place for people to be. And they just don't want to run out unless they're pushed out. And Kushner's trying a Middle East peace, but, I mean, just based on my reporting, he's distracted, to say the least. Um, when I think of the President of the United States, I think of so much work. So I was just wondering, with him playing golf and watching TV, how does he get things done? <laughs> so throughout the campaign, he would always watch television. Throughout his presidency, he has always watched television. He believes that television is, the, is an honest medium to him. And he'd rather trust his own view of cable and watch the Chiron, watch the news, than his own advisors at times because he thinks television it has to speak to a national mass audience to keep viewers. And that's what the goal of the television producer is to keep the audience, to grow the audience. Then he wants to see what those kind of producers are thinking. He produced his own show for a decade with The Apprentice. And he watched The Apprentice. That's why I always say to people about President Trump, the best way to be with President Trump is not to be in the same room or not to do a TV interview with him. The best interviews I've ever had with him are all over the phone. Because when he's in the room, he's focused on his, his hair, which I've seen him do. He carries around these hairspray bottles in a canvas bag. I thought they were tall boys of Miller Lite or something. It turns out they are hairspray bottles. But he's always watching television because that's how he wants to process everything. And he thinks that's, that's what people are watching. Therefore, it's unfiltered to me. He gets things done by doing tweets, he fires people by tweet. It's interesting about firing. Someone so famous for saying you're fired, he really doesn't like to fire people directly. Rather do it with a little bit of a distance with the tweet. Have Kelly call, then do the tweet. You don't see a lot of direct interaction there, revealing in some way. And uh, you see him also just constantly making decisions on his own, reacting with his gut. Not guided by ideology. And the myth about Bannon wasn't really a myth. People always thought it was Bannon the puppet, or so maybe Kelly the puppet. If you know Trump, you know there is no puppet. No one can control President Trump. No one. Everyone around him really knows this. And he gets things done because it comes back to what I've always observed from day one when I met him, the most relentless person I have ever encountered. Never stops talking and, and moving around and doing things. Action, action, action. Whether it's bad, good, mean, nice, action. And so he gets a lot done. Does a lot. I mean, if you look back at his presidency, with all the controversy, there's been a lot that's happened. I mean, we've, think about the Muslim ban. People don't even talk about it. I mean, can you imagine that any other president in history bans a religion, in, es in essence, from coming to the United States? It'd be all we talked about for years. It'd be the, the core of their re-election campaign against them. People barely speak about things. Trump knows this. Throughout the campaign, he would say, I'm going to distract with liveliness, distract with another issue. He always is saying action is the solution to everything because people, people get exhausted and they do not know how to follow. He understands the more he's out there, the more the story has to change. And because he's president of the United States, the media just can't ignore when the president does something. We try to be judicious. We try not to overcover the tweets. But he's president of the United States. And so everything he does, like the, the 10 minutes on Sunday railing against the Washington Post and Amazon while he's going to his Trump International Golf Club in Florida, what, are we supposed to turn a blind eye to that? No, we have to write an article. We write an article that he's false in what he's saying. And, and, and Amazon does not own the Washington Post. And, the post office is not overburdened by Amazon. These things are constant in our face. So we're not always, talk, we're not always able to cover the, the real core issues. We're trying to, trying our best. But he's out there all the time. So when your question is, how did he get things done? When is he not getting things done? Not maybe significant things in terms of legislation, but he's out there every day, 24-7. One more, I guess, or no? Uh, one one more. more. Yes, sir. That's an insider question. <laughs> this guy follows everything. Kellyanne Conway, what a survivor. 
she was taunting everybody the day on Fox News. I don't know if you saw it. She said, oh, Bannon's gone. I'm here. Because <laughs> someone was calling her the leaker in chief. But Conway loves that she's there. And she's close to Trump. She understands Trump like a lot of advisors do not. And this is why she's still there, why she could be, even if she doesn't take on communications directly, she understands that there is only one communications director in this administration, Donald John Trump. And she knows that. Because she knows that she has that insight, she could take it on as a portfolio. She's already senior counsel to the president. But she knows where this is all heading. He's his own chief of staff. He's his own communications director. You're either on the train or you're not. A lot of people are getting off the train, but she's saying, I'm going to be with him. And she says she grew up in a blue-collar family with a single mother. She said, I grew up with a lot of people like Donald Trump. She understands him as a cultural figure. She understands his personality. And he's not, she, of course, is a Republican operative, but she understands Trump as a person. So many people struggle to understand Trump as a person because they want to say, like Paul Manafort used to say to people, he's a child. Let's manage him like a child. I want to be the parent. But then they realize he's not a child. He's actually a, an adult. An adult who can scheme, an adult who can lead, an adult who can be mean. He's an adult. Now, all these people who think, oh, he's, he's like a kid. We'll tell him what to do. He'll follow us. Every person I've covered who thinks that, that this president is a child, they're gone. He's there. Thank you. Thank you.